Welcome to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. This podcast is about all things outdoor photography, including landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more. The show features two talented photographers, Henry Doyle and Ryan Taylor, who bring their different experiences in photography to the podcast. The show is released weekly every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so I hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In today's episode, we have Evan Parker on the show, a Moab and Canton support and education specialist. We go over the basics of photo printing, what papers to choose from, and other specifics such as color management, profiling, and more. Evan also discusses the importance of preserving your work outside the digital realm and how learning from others can improve your printing workflow, and why every photographer should see their work out in the real world. Welcome back to episode 55 of the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. And today we're going into the print world of photography. Yes, we have Evan Parker on the show. Uh, welcome, Evan. Uh, and tell us more about what you do for a living and your photography. Yeah, thanks. It's always a bit odd to uh, talk about prints on a podcast, but I think, we can, I think we can do it. I think we make it interesting and at least we can paint pictures in people's heads and then they can hop online or <clears throat> go to their favorite photo retailer and check out some paper and, mm -hmm. and get fired up. So Awesome. Yeah, so thanks for coming on tonight. Um, and you are kind of our first guest um, with any kind of like major printing experience. So it's it's great to have a new perspective on. Well, the, you know, sort of my joke is that in the old days, you wouldn't ever take your negatives over to somebody's house and, and hold them up and say, oh, look at this cool shot. Well, that's sort of your phone is the equivalent of your negatives now, right? So if it's in your phone, mm. it's a picture. If you print it, it's a photograph because that's mm. the that's the completion of the process, you know, for 150 years, that was the only way anybody could see anything. Yeah. And all of a sudden we've, we've got screens and online and we're constantly sharing all this content, but also when you print it, it forces you to slow down a little more and look at your composition, look at your editing. Yeah, definitely. Consider what paper you're going to use and how that influences the image. It's, it sort of slows it down. So I, uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up with a dark room. So from when I was young enough to remember, I would go down there and my dad would be printing and um, he had a, a digital timer for his enlarger, you know, that was, that was fancy. Um, and the print button was uh, glow in the dark. So he'd get it all set up and he'd get it focused and he'd get his, his test strip done. And then I get to push the print button, you know, <laughs> and suddenly the image comes on for five, 10, 15 seconds, and then it's gone. And you're left with that white sheet of blank paper and you put it in the developer and then it just appears. And that was a hundred percent where I was hooked. And I thought, well, this is pretty darn cool. So, uh, high school, I worked for the local paper. I of course ran the photo darkroom for the yearbook and just always wanted to be a photographer as my, as my real job. And I've been lucky enough to do that now for what, 16 years, I think this makes it. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. And, and then when digital printing really took off, I think my first printer was an Epson 2200. And that was, that was sort of the dark room on steroids, right? I didn't have to disappear for four hours. I didn't have to get all my chemicals out. I lived <laughs> in a little apartment then where I couldn't have had a dark room, but you put this printer in your desk and poof, there it is. And then over the years, just learning as much as I could and, and, and realizing that as I kind of got into it and friends would call and say, Hey, I need help on this. Or can you print this? Or that, you know, education was really lacking overall. And then mm -hmm. starting with Moab and getting an opportunity to teach printing and color management and, and answer questions. And it's been a real, it's been a real fun process. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's awesome. How's it been seeing the, just the evolution of printing at large? How's it been throughout your lifetime on seeing that? It's, it's pretty cool. And, and it's really, it's really fun that I think to some degree, it's kind of, that's what everybody said about the internet, right? It's sort of democratized printing. You didn't have to have access to a dark room. You didn't have to have one in your house. Now you can put a printer in your desk and if you can use software, you can make a print and, and you can bring that to life yourself. So I think it's, I think a lot of people are afraid to start, but once you start, you're hooked. Mm. Right. Yeah, I've always likened the whole, whole process to being like printing, like he says, like the final piece of the puzzle. 
and love. You know, it's like your work isn't really fully actualized because you're seeing on these like digital screens nowadays, of course. But like when you actually print it, it's like it just takes on a whole new different form and world to you. Yeah, and I hope that this I hope that this never changes. But you don't go into a gallery and have a bunch of TVs on the wall, right? You go into mm-hmm. a gallery and there's a bunch of photos because when something that tangibly exists, we have a relationship with it. You know, you put a photo on your wall. And every time you walk by it, you remember the person, the place, um, the time. You see something different in the image. You know, it, it has a connection. And, mm-hmm. and you don't foster that connection when it's even in a digital photo frame on your desk and they're slide showing every minute or whatever. It's, it's more of this passive entertainment versus you hang something on the wall and, and it engages you at a different level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think like a, another kind of example is the, of that is like, say you're a, a bird photographer, like nobody will necessarily want to look at a picture of a bird on your phone. But if they come to your house and see a, a giant picture of a bird, you know, they'll admire it, even if they're maybe not in that space. I think it kind of brings it to everyone. It does. And it and it also allows you to, to tell a story about maybe that's the, the kingfisher that you chased for a week on this trip and you, you, know, you finally got it on the last day and and right so suddenly mm-hmm. you're you're slogging through the mud maybe it's a snowy owl and your fingers are frozen and you're on your third battery and yeah. you know it it's just it's part of the story and it's part of the experience for sure mm-hmm. definitely yeah. i feel like the, yeah the medium and format of like printing itself is just such more it allows you to stop and pause and really contemplate the image or yeah you feel more of the story i think with it um, compared to like the fast pacedness of like, you know, digital screens nowadays too. Yeah, and I talk with I, I talk with some colleagues of mine who you know they do a lot of do a lot of publishing work on Instagram and things like that, and they say you know printing is is the opposite. Like Instagram just feels like you got to feed the beast, and it goes out there and and you never hear from it again. And whereas if you print it, you have a different relationship with the image, and the viewers have a completely different relationship with the image. So you know both are incredible tools. One is just sort of the slower, um, more nuanced display. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. It feels more permanent, I'd say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, going kind of more into your background here with the transition from kind of film to printing, um, was that kind of an instant thing for you once you kind of got the digital technology or did it take a while to fully transition? I think the the excitement was instant. Um, hmm. But when you're young and you're starting out, you don't know what you don't know. So I look back at some of those old prints and I think, wow, this was this decent, but man, I could do a better job now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to get good results out of the gate and, and just sort of play with it. I think the biggest thing for people is don't be afraid to make a mistake, right? I remember when my grandmother first got a computer, she was terrified to touch it because she might break something. Well, when you're printing photos, you're not going to break anything. I mean, I've even put the paper in upside down, right? And I pull the thing out, and it's <laughs> wet, and it's a mess. And but the printer keeps going, right? We're all we're all going to make mistakes. We're all human. And and the other hesitation I think that people have is they say, "Well, the ink's so expensive." Well, compared to darkroom chemicals and time, the ink is pretty inexpensive for most printers. An eight by ten is going to cost you, you know, a dollar in ink, a dollar fifty in ink at the most. Um, mm-hmm. So put the paper in there and and go for it uh number one so i i was never hesitant and and i just sort of jumped into it and and at that point you know this was 2003 2004 we didn't have smartphones right we didn't carry our cameras in our pockets all the time so you know people would come over maybe you'd have a a family event well i could snap a photo because it was digital then and print it by the end of the evening and people would go home with a a four by six even and it it blew them away so Mm -hmm. it was a really really fun way to do that but no i always i always enjoyed it and i always wanted to go bigger right you get a you get a desktop printer like oh eight by ten that's great oh i want to do bigger oh i got a 13 by 19 now oh i want to go bigger i remember i got my first roll printer used from a print shop i drove an hour to get it stuffed it in the back of the car brought it back and suddenly i could make you like a 24 by 36 and it blew me away and then you make a few of those and you think, wow, that's great. I have this giant printer with these giant prints and I'm almost out of wall space. <laughs> I got I to gotta leverage this somehow. Um, 
but I came, I think it was winter of 2010. I started with Moab because the, the local store here, Glazers in Seattle, uh, they were doing a print event and whoever was going to do the printing for that weekend wasn't able to make it. And one of my contacts down there called me and said, if you're around this weekend, we need you to come down and make prints. And I thought, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I spent the weekend talking to customers and, and making prints of the files they brought in and hit it off with the, with the sales rep from, from Moab, from Legion Paper. And that's kind of what started uh, my position of, of education and, and profiling and, and all that kind of stuff. So that was a fortuitous event. But you know, as, as with most things in photography and, and in life, it's, it's who you know, and it's, and it's just being in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah it, it's, it's neat that you have that uh, kind of like attitude with uh, going into printing because most people I, I've heard are like like you said like the ink costs or they just are it's such a daunting task and they don't know where to begin but um, I honestly would just recommend it's like just go with it and just trial and error basically and just see what happens yeah and and we worked really hard to get a good set of videos on YouTube to cover color management and paper and and setup and all the things that are important that are not just paper and ink and editing, uh, because there is a lot to learn. And it, traditionally, it's been really hard, you know, when you're sitting at home on a Saturday, I want to print, I'm kind of concerned it's not going to come out right, you know, what do I do? Well, uh, the internet is a great resource. But as I tell people, if you're struggling with, with, with one specific question, you know, give yourself 10 minutes to do a search for it. And if you can't find the answer, you got to pull the Google parachute and uh, and get out of there because it's it's not going to get better as you put more time into it. And and the biggest thing, just like you guys are doing here, is to create a community. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, if people have questions, you know, on all our webinars, we put our email up there, we put the the forums up there because sometimes what can seem insurmountable to you because you hit this wall, well, we've all been there. So if you can reach out to you know your your local camera store, your camera club, your friends who print. Um, your favorite paper company, be it Moab or Canson, um, you know, we're here to help and we're here to make that community and we all learn from each other because I've made a lot of mistakes, but I can leverage that to, to help people. And, and I learn things from, from our customers at events and, and from the emails they send me too. So it's a, it's just creating that, that larger community with, with a common goal. Right. Yeah, for sure. And it's, there's almost an art form, of course, the printing. I mean, there's a technical side of it, but like the art form is really where you learn from other people too, which is neat. Yeah. There is. And, and, you know, people will still ask, well, what about, you know, print sharpening on matte paper at this size? I'm not an expert in print sharpening that maybe that'll come in my next decade of, of exploration. Right. But mm -hmm. you can, you can have a totally satisfying experience even if you're not at the pinnacle of your technical knowledge, right? Just just jump in wherever your comfort zone is now and and work through it because whatever the outcome is going to be, it's going to be a net positive and you're going to learn a lot and really enjoy it and and have something to share with friends or family or or even sell, you know, depending on if that's part of your goal with your prints. Mm -hmm. Have you done any personal selling yourself of your print work? I have not. Um, a lot of the work that I do doesn't really lend itself to that for a lot of the, the sort of commercial day-to-day -day work. So most of my photos are uh, homes and interiors and then corporate mm -hmm. events and, and things like that. So not usually stuff people want to buy prints of, but I have done printing for uh, friends and colleagues of mine who have, who have tried to buy, either tried to print it themselves and, and kind of struggled with that, or they haven't found a lab they really like. Um, so that's been a lot of fun because then I can I can kind of get them going, make some prints for them, and then they go off and do the do the art fair or do the gallery show or or whatever else. But no, most of the stuff I print either hangs on my wall or one thing we like to do around the holidays is give stacks of of uh, greeting cards out. So I'll pick five or ten images from the past year, print those, and give people stacks of cards. That's a really popular one. It's a great idea. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, greeting cards are a great way to display your photography, of course, too. Yeah, and they're and they're nice enough that if somebody is so inclined, um, you you could frame it and leave it on the wall for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. you you mentioned um, interior photography. There is that kind of a, a side thing um, along with your printing job, or uh, how does that play into your photography? 
No, the photography for me is is kind of my full time job. Oh, okay. um, and the the paper printing stuff is is a more of a part time. But it's and that's a big advantage for the for the print side of it because I not only can I talk to folks about printing, but we can talk about photography and and techniques and you know why you pick a lens for an image is the same kind of decision as to why you pick a paper for a print, mm. and they're all they're all related. Interesting. What, what kind of photo do you think would be suited well for creating a print? Oh, I mean. A photo that you like, number one, right? It has to be a photo that you want to look at. Um, number two, it has to be, to some degree, it has to be technically well executed, right? Obviously, if it's super noisy or out of focus or whatever else, it's not going to necessarily make a great print. Of course, there are no hard and fast rules because maybe it is an out of focus reflection of something and that's what you wanted. Or maybe you were shooting a rodeo in the evening and ISO 10,000 is as low as you could go and, and it's got noise in it, but that grittiness is part of the event. Um, but mainly it has to be something that, that you're proud of um, and that you're going to want to look at tomorrow and next week and maybe next year if you leave it up long enough. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's really up to the, it's really up to the artist, you know, it's sort of like, do you do a charcoal sketch? Do you do colored pencils? Do you do watercolor? Do you do uh, oil paints? You know, anything that's in your creative area is going to look good on paper. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I like the uh, first point you made about how it has to be a photo you like, because you can print something, but like, you're not really going to like identify with it. We'll say. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes when I'm doing an edit, uh, I'll make small prints and I'll lay them out and I'll think, well, I like these. This one, it just doesn't grab me. And then you can set it off to the side. And I remember, you know, years ago doing portfolios for review and, and you, you'd spend so long picking your images and then you'd print them out and you'd lay them out on the floor and you'd match them up and this and that, and ah, maybe not that one. And then you'd, you'd get somebody else to come weigh in. And, but yeah, the, the big part is print something that you want to show off that connects with you that you're proud of because then number one you've made it permanent and number two you're, you're going to want to show it off you're going to want to share it and you're going to be inspired to to go to the next step yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's great so, so when that's... when you're kind of pr doing your personal work uh with the printing do you still are you still kind of at the stage where you need to print multiple times or do you have those settings fine-tuned now no i think that uh, for me personally, I can, I can see it on the screen. I can pick the paper, you know, kind of get it dialed in and, and away it goes. Um, and people never believe me when I say this, but once you get comfortable with the print process and you remember to choose the media setting and the color profile, and you kind of get a sense of how the paper changes the image, you won't have to make multiple prints either. You know, you get your monitor calibrated, um, you get a good light source for reviewing your prints so that you know that what you're seeing is actually what the paper looks like. And you can just set it up. You know, it's it's prep your image, uh, pick your paper, set your print size, color profile, media setting, and away you go. And it and it, even though it sounds like voodoo, it should be that easy. And of course there'll be times when you're when you're gonna tinker with the sharpening or you're gonna print it out, and you're gonna notice that you've got some artifacts from a cloning or or maybe you pushed the saturation in the sky too far and you've got some halos and things like that that you didn't see on the screen but those aren't print mistakes those are just editing tools that we learn when we make the print but it should be once you're once you have the framework it should be a pretty easy straightforward process to getting that image on paper the way it looks on the screen yeah, definitely. Um, in my experience, yeah, with photo papers, it's definitely each one lends itself well to certain types of images. Um, you know, be it you know maybe black and white looks better on matte paper or something like that. But um, do you think there's certain types of images that work best with uh, certain papers? Yeah, the the real goal of paper is in the darkroom. We had a pretty narrow selection. You had a, a fiber paper. You had a gloss. You had what was called a mat then, but wasn't the same mat as we have now. But now with digital, you can you can have a lot of texture, you can have a little texture, you can have warm white, bright white, you know, bright a gloss luster. 
um, long fiber Japanese paper, canvas, and there's so many options. And so what I tell people to do when you're starting out is get a sample box. For instance, the Moab sample box comes with two sheets of every paper. Pick an image that you love, download all the profiles, uh, settle in for the evening, and print that same image on you know, five, eight, ten different papers, and you'll be blown away by how much the paper changes the image. Um, a, a glossy or a luster or even a Baraita paper, those are going to be really photorealistic, right? It's going to feel like you're right there. To some people, a, a high gloss is, is too much. Um, and in that case, kind of a Baraita is a great choice because it's a little more subtle gloss, but it still has those, those uh, rich, detailed shadows, good gamut, great saturation. And then as you move into the the, the matte papers, um, because a matte surface doesn't reflect as much light, you're not going to get quite as much detail in the dark shadows. Um, your prints are going to look a little more subtle, but you're kind of shifting over into more artistic territory. So if you have a, you know, a, a foggy morning or you have mist on the lake or, or things like that, you put that on a matte paper and suddenly the feeling of being there, of it being, you know, kind of quiet, and, and a real subtle, soft light. You've accentuated that just by selecting, you know, a smooth cotton rag paper, and the viewer picks up on that. They don't notice it. You know, I'm probably the only person that goes to a, a gallery show and is trying to figure out what paper they picked for each one of their <laughs> prints. But by using that paper, you are saying to your viewer, here's how I want you to feel when you look at this image. And then as you as you go farther off from there, you know, if you have a an image that's got a lot of rocks in it and you put that on a textured paper, suddenly those rocks have like a three-dimensional texture. Or if you want to do something similar to the, the classic Japanese scroll paintings, um, the Unryu is a really thin, long fiber Japanese paper and, and you can print on that and it's translucent and almost backlight it and suddenly your photography has become, you know, drawings from the, from the 18th century. So it's it's all about using the papers to present the image as you see it in your mind. And there's there's really no wrong answers because it's that creative process as to. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it sounds like you can really just completely transform an image. Uh, that that brings vision. that vision in my head to life where then suddenly, yeah, I can communicate with the viewer and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking and they get it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, what, what about metal printing? Is that, um, something you've looked into as well, or is that kind of a, a separate area? Yeah. You know, the, the traditional metal prints, the order from a lab, that's not something that's easily done at home. Uh, we had a, we had a metallic silver paper for a while, but the, uh, the mill that was making it just decided it was, it was too challenging to make. So we're in the process of retooling that to relaunch it, but that was a, you know, a silver base metallic paper that let you make an aluminum looking print at home, which was, which was very cool. So that should be back hopefully later this year, we'll have a new version of it, but yeah, no aluminum printing is, I think one of those things that if you're using the sheets of aluminum best left to the professionals, cause that is, that is a challenge. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certain processes, I just would be like, eh, outsource it, you know, just because of how yeah. difficult they can be or costly even. Well, and that's that's the thing too is there's no there's absolutely no shame in if if you you know really want to print, but maybe you don't have the space for a printer right now or the budget for a printer or the time. Maybe you're learning new software or whatever else. Uh, find a good lab, find a a print shop in your neighborhood, and and build a relationship with them because whether you make the print or they make the print, the end result is still that you get this incredible print. So yeah, no. Mm -hmm. uh, no hesitation to work with a lab if if that's more your your speed than doing your own printing. So you you'd recommend kind of the more local option rather than some of the big name photo labs. I always like a local shop. You know we're mm -hmm. totally spoiled here because we have two independent camera stores. We've got Glazers uh, and then we've got Kenmore Camera. Both have been around for a long time. You know both great local shops that host classes, and camera clubs, and got salespeople that have been there for, for sometimes, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, and they know their stuff and, and you go in there and, you know, maybe you're looking for a lens or maybe you need some advice or it's all right there. You know, online is great, but 
you can't call them up and spend a half an hour on the phone talking about how you know this old Fuji camera you had and you loved it, and then you went to this one and the color was a little different and the lens, right? The guy's going to be like, "Are we making a sale or you know, are we hanging up?" Um, <laughs> but just really utilizing those those local resources, especially now as as we've lost so much local retail and, and knowledge, is there's there's no substitute for that. And an online lab is is great, especially if you're doing a big volume or if you're a wedding photographer and you're cranking out albums. You know they do a great job. They're generally a little less expensive, but at the expense of having that close relationship and maybe going in and saying, "Yeah, I've never used this paper before. Can you tell me a little about it? Can we make a little test print so I can see how it's going to look and and that sort of thing?" And and a good lab too will supply you with their output profiles so you can soft proof on your computer and get a sense of how that print's going to look before you even uh, send the file in. Yeah, that's that's awesome, and I know also uh, at least my local camera store they they let you even bring in your file and look at it on their like very accurate monitor with those profiles as well. So, yeah, definitely local is the way to go. It is, and it's just again it fosters that community. You know, I've gotten mm -hmm. I've met colleagues at camera stores. I've gotten assignments from maybe salespeople that I've worked with that had somebody come in and say, "Hey, I'm I'm looking for a, an extra shooter on this," or or whatever else. It's just, it's that whole, you know, keeping the, keeping the community in your photography. Yeah, for sure. On the flip side. Yeah. What would you say about printing from home? Like maybe the pros and cons compared to the, the photo lab row? Uh, well, if you're printing at home, it gets expensive in a hurry to make a big print. You know, if you want to make a 2436, well, you're going to need a 24 inch roll printer. That's going to be three or $4,000. Uh, the one that I'm sitting next to is, you know, six and a half feet wide. It's four feet tall. It's three feet deep. Um, if you're living in a Manhattan apartment, you're going to put a tablecloth on it and, you know, serve dinner because that's the only place it's it's going to go. But so I'd say the one drawback to to printing from home is that you can't easily make large prints. Um, the advantages to printing from home are are numerous. You can, you know, get instant results. Um, you can print anytime. So if you're a night owl and you're up Saturday night doing editing, you know, make yourself a print. You, you get up early, you want to do a little bit, it's, it's right there waiting for you. Uh, like I said, if you have, you know, family over and you take a family photo, you can give everybody a copy before they leave. Or if you're doing an assignment, you know, you can come home, edit quickly, make a print, maybe give it to your client. Or on the flip side, if you're trying to update your portfolio for a, for an interview next week, you can spend the weekend, make some new prints. You instantly know if they're what you want instead of waiting for a lab print to come. And, you know, maybe it's not quite what you had in mind. Um, and away you go. And it lets you really explore all the options. Yeah. So uh, is there any other like things you want to add about papers in general for you? Um, d don't be afraid to explore is number one. And and don't feel like you have to be a paper expert. Do the do the sample box. Do the eight ten papers. Make the prints. Look at them. Pick two or three, and those are going to be your go tos for the next six months or or a year, however long. And you're going to get to the point where you're going to say, "Man, I love these, but what about this or what about that?" And you're going to pull out those prints that you made at the beginning, that hopefully you kept around because that's the whole point. You're going to thumb through them and you're going to say, "Oh, this, you know, this paper, this." Um, Mo and Kobe Kozo, it's subtle. It's a really velvet surface. It almost looks like you could touch it. You know, I did this great series of abstract landscapes that would look amazing on this paper. I'm going to try that. And then, you know, maybe there's a paper that that you've used a lot, like we'll say the Exhibition Luster, and you're like, I love that, but it's it's traditional. You know, it doesn't it doesn't get me fired up anymore. So I'm going to set that one off to the side. I'm going to add the Kozo, and I'm going to go print this set of images, and I'm I'm super fired up about it. So, um, just don't feel like you have to be an expert of everything and don't be afraid to experiment for sure. That's great. Yeah. Um, so moving on to maybe the, like the hardware side, the computer side, um, talk more about maybe color profiles and monitor calibration. Yeah. So the, the goal of this whole thing is consistency. So when you snap a photo in your digital camera or when you scan a negative, those colors get converted to to numbers, right? Color in digital is, it's math, it's plottable on a three-dimensional graph. 
and and that three dimensional graph is what we call uh, gamut. So the gamut is the total number of available colors, possible colors. You know what we capture is a is a small portion of that, but your gamut is your overall. And what you want to do is when you adjust that raw file and you look at it on your screen, and then you print it, you want those numbers to always stay consistent. So first off, profile your monitor. Now, <clears throat> why do you do that? Because the computer video card has no idea what's on your screen. You could be looking at a black and white image on your screen. You know, like, let's say your screen has gone black and white. The computer doesn't know that. It's sending out a full color video signal. Um, so the monitor calibrator sits on your screen and it reads one or two or 400 color patches. And it, it compares those color patches to the values they should be. And it says, oh, this green is a little too yellow, or this red is a little too magenta. And at the end of that process, it makes a color profile, which is just a, a little adaptation table. So the computer sends out the image, it goes through the, the color profile, and, and there on your screen, it's exactly how it should look. And making a print profile is the same process. We print a couple thousand color patches. They get read in by a spectrophotometer. They go through the profile creation process. And at the end of that, we have our output profile. And so that makes sure that the colors that are on your screen are matched as closely as possible on paper. Now, a uh, uh, Adobe RGB monitor, a 10-bit monitor, can display more colors usually than we can get on our papers, which is fine. The, the process of going from the computer to the printer through the color profile does something called rendering intent. And what rendering intent does is it changes those out of gamut colors, those colors we can't print one to one, and adjusts them so they look natural on the page, but they're not exactly what they were on the screen. And so if everything's working right, even though some of the colors in your print have been changed intentionally, it will still look extremely close to the monitor because our eyes are low looking at that comparison about how all those colors relate to each other. So important step number one, calibrate your monitor. Important step number two, make sure you're printing with a color profile for your paper, and then make sure that when we publish a color profile, we match a media setting to every paper. So when you download that profile, keep an eye on what uh, media setting to use. And if you have a profile monitor and you're using the correct printer profile, the last step is to have a good light source to evaluate that because prints uh, are viewed from reflected light. And so if you have, say, a fluorescent light and a standard you know, desk lamp, the prints are going to look completely different because that fluorescent light is uh, green in color. It has some of the visible spectrum available, but not all of it. So colors might simply disappear in a print if you're looking at it under a, a poor light source. The sun is always a great light source, but especially here in the Northwest in January, um, its moments are fleeting, and the last thing you want to do is take your print out when it's raining to get a nice <laughs> looking outdoor light at it. So mm -hmm. the last step to that process is having a, a desk lamp or an overhead light with a really good um, LED bulb, or as long as you remember that it's going to be a little warm tone, you know, a standard incandescent bulb is going to be full spectrum. It's just going to be a little more yellow than a normal light source. So those are the, those are the most important things, and those help to ensure that Whatever you're seeing, you can trust your eyes, and you can base your decisions on that. Do you also, with lighting, like recommend mimicking um, kind of the light that it will be displayed in? Like maybe it'll be in a, a dark part of your house. Like, would you recommend something like that? You know, that's ideal, um, but that's sort of the the two hundred level education of lighting. Um, if you're going to display a print in a dark part of your house, keep in mind that prints are not lit right they don't illuminate like a monitor does so if you're going to put a print in a dark place you're going to have to light it in some way because it doesn't matter how much you crank the exposure on that the print's still going to look dark just because there's not enough light to reflect um at the other end of that if you're doing a high-end gallery show uh people will go in and especially if they're working with a with a custom printer that that printer may go in and measure the light source in the gallery make a specific profile for those lights in the gallery, print the show images, and when someone comes in and, and buys an image, they're not actually taking that image off the wall. They're going to get 
a print that's made to a standard um, light source in the profile so that it looks good in, in their environment. Because if we sold them the custom one off the gallery wall, it's not going to look quite the same when they get it home. But that's the real, mm -hmm. you know, that's the real high end um, color management where you, it's, it's worth the time and investment to do that because of the price you're able to sell the prints for or, or whatever else. But no, the, the biggest thing is just start with the basics. And then as your needs increase, you know, you can reassess your workflow and your tools. It's just like mm -hmm. when you're starting out in photography, you're not going to go out and buy a, a high-end mirrorless and fifteen thousand dollars worth of f two eight lenses and and a couple of studio lights and everything else, right? You're going to start with a simple camera and a simple lens, and 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 you're going to learn. You know, if you're new to printing, you're back to that basic point. Don't don't go out and and buy the Ferrari when you just got your driver's license. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, would you say for the beginners, like it's an absolute must to have all those calibration tools? Uh, well, I think to... the, the best thing is, again, this gets us back to, to who you know. If you're in a camera club and you're just kind of getting started, uh, bring in your laptop and have someone who has a calibrator bring that in and, and have them calibrate it for you. And, and they can kind of teach you the ins and outs of that. Um, if you have a couple of friends and, and one of you has one, you know, maybe you figure out what the rental cost for that is. Is it a couple of sheets of paper? Is it a print? Is it a six pack of beer? So you can borrow that for the weekend and, and calibrate your monitor. And, you know, it's it's all about fostering that. But a good monitor calibrator is is pretty inexpensive, you know, $175 for most people. And that thing will last you many years. So it's a that's the most important investment, I would say. Get the get the monitor calibrator, get the printer. And and away you go, yeah. And make Let's sure say, you load in those profiles, right? Yes, of yeah. course. But those are free, so that's good. Oh, that's good. Right. <laughs> Makes it a little easier. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, let's say you get the monitor calibrator. Now, how often would you uh, calibrate your displays? So the the average place to start is do it once a month. So so do it. Wait a month. Do it again, and then at the end you can do a before and after comparison. And if you do the before and after comparison and nothing changes, well, then you know that in your environment, that's stable for a month. So then wait two months and, and calibrate it and do your before and after. And you'll find out at some point in there, it'll, it'll change visibly. And then you know that that's your interval. Um, in the old days with, with you know, analog CRT monitors, design houses would calibrate every morning before they started work because things could literally change overnight. And you had to make sure that your color was consistent day to day. But thankfully, that's you know that's only in high end, and that's become much less with these really stable LED displays that we have, and and everything else like that. So start with once a month, and then figure out what your necessary interval is from there. And there are, um, you know, there are high end displays. Apple's new what is it Pro Display XDR. You actually can't calibrate that at home. And that's because they've they've gone in and they've figured out, you know, what the half-life is of the photons in the layers, and they know how the color degrades after so many hours, minutes, and seconds of use, and the thing actually adapts as it ages. But you'd hope wow. that, you know, for five thousand dollars they've invested some time and money into that. So mm -hmm. there are exceptions to every rule, but for for most of us, yeah, you're gonna calibrate it yourself on a on a semi-regular schedule. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but... I I recently got one myself, and um, I was I was reading a bit, and I think one important thing, right, is to kind of have your the lighting conditions in your room that you, you use for editing most frequently. So make sure you have that when you calibrate. Yeah, and make sure if you're using a newer Mac, turn off the True Tone display where it decides mm -hmm. to change colors, and turn off the Night Shift where suddenly everything is uh is yellow after nine p.m. Yeah. So you definitely have to be aware of that. Otherwise, it'll it'll jump out of the bushes and get you. <laughs> like the Hashi and you have to you know, batch edit it afterwards. Right. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So you guys received uh, some of the new Canson Arsh papers from us and I think made some test prints. And I'm curious to get sort of your opinions on that because I think that, that those were matte papers and, and maybe kind of out of your comfort zone. Yeah, um, yeah, I received uh, I think four packages of uh, eight and a half by eleven, um, ten sheets each, and um, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really like matte paper before this, but now I'm, I'm definitely sold on it. 
Um, I just never liked the, how flat it looked, I guess. I always thought like a luster was much more of my style, but um, yeah, using these papers, I really, I really, really enjoyed how it looked um, just presenting with different landscapes or uh, even wildlife images. Um, but yeah, they're really awesome. And how did it, how did it sort of change your perception between the luster and the, and the cotton rag? Like what, what things jumped out at you or, or what maybe didn't you notice before? Well, uh, I would say the texture actually, because a lot of them did have a um, not so much grainy, but almost like a canvas kind of texture to it, which I felt like added a lot more dimension. And like you talked about earlier, like just it looked like more three dimensional. Um, one particular image I took, it's a very like minimalist kind of landscape of like a foggy field early in the morning. And the top half of the image is just the blank gray sky and the fog. Um, but I uh, printed it on a textured, you know, one of the matte papers and it added this like new. Th uh, kind of dimension, I guess, to it that was you wouldn't see otherwise, basically. Uh, whereas if I use a gloss paper, it'd be much more flat, of course. Well, and, and you threw me a, a softball on that one, too, right? A, a foggy morning is not glossy in real life. So you're sort of fighting the feeling using a luster, but on a mat, again, you're you're right back there in in the reality of the moment. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I guess it's the way we perceive the moment there. But yeah, um, it definitely felt more realistic to the conditions also in the weather that day too. So now you can uh, set your luster off to the side and, and add one of those arch papers into your into your common rotation. Yeah, we won't judge you if you still do a little luster, but uh, so we've expanded <laughs> we've expanded your horizons a little bit, which is which is a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the output I've done so far, it's it's definitely uh, made me rethink my whole process with printing in general too. Excellent. Would you recommend, uh, like, for in, in terms of fine art, we'll say, like, limited or open edition prints? Like, is that something you've ever um, experimented with? You know, the the difference with editioning in digital printing versus analog is that you have to be really diligent to give that value to your collectors, right? Because in the past, you know, maybe the artist would do the addition of 250 or 500 and then at the extreme end, they'd, you know, damage the negative or they'd, or they'd break the glass plate or something so that no other images could be created from that. Um, so with digital, you definitely have to, to set your addition number early and maybe decide you're going to do, say, 250 uh, of a smaller size at a less expensive cost. And then maybe you're only going to do 100 of the larger prints and and stick to that. And the other thing that's really important is if you have the space to make all of those prints at once, because as software evolves, things can get changed. I've worked with print shops that, you know, maybe they had to get a new computer partway through a big print run. And because software changes, drivers change, whatever else, they're unable to perfectly match what they made a couple months ago to what they make now with the with the new equipment and that definitely is a is an unexpected thing that we wouldn't think of when it comes to you know doing high end editions but but yeah uh pick your number if you can you know print it all at once or if you can't print it all at once the best thing you can do and for people who are running print shops out there my advice is always take a computer that when you when you buy a new printer the computer and the printer uh, are married together and they they spend their working life together. They don't get software updates. They don't change. They they exist in this one sort of alternate universe by themselves running together. And that way you know that the print you made a year ago is going to match the print you make tomorrow and the one you make six months from now. Um, so that's, so a, that's a key are consideration. You, are you saying a separate computer for printing? If you're running a print shop, I absolutely recommend that. If you're working from home, no, because it's not going to be critical that the print. You know, you made to start the edition last year, right? That's that's not something we usually encounter at home. That's a print shop thing. But but just thinking about high end editions and and consistency, that's something you have to think about. Okay, that makes sense. That's uh, that's that's interesting. I, I never thought about that because. You know, with computers, you never know what weird software could enter in. So by leaving it, uh, that's that's a great idea for sure. And that and that kind of goes for. I put this at the end of all of my all of my talks. Is you know, 
approach all software updates with caution. I had a buddy who had to go do a shoot in Shanghai that involved on-site printing. Well, the week before he left, his Lightroom updated itself. Uh, and on the plane over there, he realized that the print function had disappeared. Oh. So he had to, you know, do some internet trickery and and get back to his home network and download it and install it because he couldn't get it in China and, and all this other stuff. You know, wow. 48 hours of terror later, he got it to work. But make sure that, you know, if you are printing for a portfolio review or or you're going to a photo class or whatever else, you know, don't don't say yes to that software update the night before you leave because it will only bring you uh, sadness. It will not bring you joy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really unfortunate. I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine that. Yeah, but it's it's those things we've got to, you know, this this podcast will live on for a long time, but right now we're getting a lot of questions from customers because Apple has put out an update that seems to have confused color management quite a bit. Um, yeah. And you can't easily go backwards. So it's just one of those things to to sort of don't be afraid of it, but but be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think another thing with color management too, at least I've found, is um, before I had my calibrator, I just tried to do it, you know, like with your monitor controls and your built-in right. controls. Right. And there was just multiple different apps, like my graphics card app had a calibrator and then my Windows had a calibrator and it, it was all these things. So um, it can get super confusing. Well, and the fascinating thing is that we all see color differently. So mm -hmm. I have no idea how you perceive the same thing. Uh, thankfully, the calibrator is has one specific target that it's that it's matched to, and and the same baseline. So you know, even people will say, "Well, I I did the visual calibration with my monitor." It's like, "Well, that's great," but no one knows how you see things. So yeah, def definitely start with the start with the. Um, the known parameters and then use your creativity on your on your images and your editing yeah i mean and black and white too even like people don't realize but you know your temperature and your, your tint of your image that has a huge effect on black and white absolutely it's all those things like we said earlier with uh, color profiles it's like choosing a like a, we'll say a launch pad to start with but then you can fine tune i guess to say like your own style of maybe photography or your print output Absolutely. But you know that if you send that file to someone and they print it or you print it, you're all working from the same baseline. You're all speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. What would you say is like the average lifespan for a printer, like if you use it uh, fairly consistently? Yeah. You know, the goal for a printer is is number one, to leave it plugged in and turned on. Um, and printers also like to be used, even if it's just a little bit. So, you know, I'd say every two weeks, print something, print a nozzle check sheet, print a grocery list, print an order confirmation, print something. It, it doesn't have to be a photograph every time. It's great if it is. Um, uh, keep it away from dust as much as possible. So when you're not using it, close the paper tray, close the mm -hmm. sheet feeder on the top. If you live in a dry environment, you know, if you live in the Southwest or if you live in, in the Northeast, um, in the winter when your heat's running all the time and it's 10% humidity in your house, um, that's brutal on, on these print heads and inks. And so people have, have written in and they say, you know, I have my little printer on a table. I put a big clear plastic trash bag over it and I put a, um, a bucket of water underneath and that just evaporates and, and passively um, humidifies the printer. Yeah. So just uh, taking good care of it, using it, mm. and uh, and that's the biggest thing. People can, you know, if you're lucky, you can get a decade out of a printer, uh, and there's no hard and fast numbers, but they they should give you a a long, a long run of service for sure. Right. Yeah. And like you said, they, you know, the printer wants to be used, so it's like you might as well use it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's it's just sitting there. You you know you and. You invested in it. You learned how to use it. Show it some love. Uh, okay. And if your if your walls are full, print those greeting cards or or print uh, gifts or whatever else for your family. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people um, when it comes to printing talk about the costs associated. Um, I know you said it's only about a dollar a print, but like when you get customer questions about the costs, like what is your what's your common response? Yeah, well, I mean, that? that's the thing is people say, oh, it's got ten inks. 
and they're $15 a piece. Well, that's $150 every time I need ink. Well, thankfully, number one, it's it's not because you're going to replace them one at a time. And if you're printing seascapes, you know, you're know you going to go through a lot of blue. You're not going to go through a lot of orange. Um, and and you, you can do a little uh, research on the internet, but it, it generally printers run a dollar to two dollars per square foot of of print for ink, right? So an eight by ten is less than a square foot. So you're looking at a dollar, a dollar twenty five for ink. Um, paper, if you're using a you know a cotton rag paper at eight and a half eleven, it's about the same. So two dollars and fifty cents paper and ink for that print. Plus you know we'll throw in a quarter for uh, nozzle checks or or whatever else. Um, but that's not you know, you look at how much you spend on cameras and software. Well, let's say you have the Adobe uh, Photography Plan at ten dollars a month. Well, that your four prints a month is the same cost as your software, so that's pretty reasonable. Um, or let's say you just bought that new lens. You know, it's it's all about kind of the investment of of your hobby. Um, but my favorite is when the when the folks that have been working in the darkroom will come up to me and say, you know, $3 of print? Are you kidding me? Like, g- give me all of it, right? In the days of the darkroom, we never thought about well, how much is the developer? How much is the stop bath? How much is the fixer? Mm-hmm. How many prints am I going to waste? Because I have to do a test strip and then I have to do another test strip. And, you know, it wasn't, it was less of the calculation, I think, because it was a lot harder to figure out, right? You weren't saying, oh, this sheet is that much. I'm going to cut it into six pieces and and that sort of thing. It it's easier, I think, to get sort of bent out of shape about things that that are right in front of us that we can easily add up. Mm-hmm. But but two dollars and fifty cents to make a print that you know you can you can share, you can look at it yourself. You, you know, maybe it'll win you some notoriety in a print competition. That's pretty darn cool. And I think where people get really frustrated is when they start out and they don't have any information they don't have any sort of knowledge to start with and they just jump in assuming that they'll know exactly how to do it and five six eight prints later you know they don't know that they have to set a specific media setting and so the prints are off or uh-huh. or whatever else they haven't calibrated their screen and like well it's purple and they're moving it and it's purple and they're moving it you know that's when you really feel cheated but just it's un- unfortunate that you just need a little more information to be successful so mm-hmm. that's the other thing. If you if you make three prints and they're all wrong in the same way, it's not you and it's not the paper. It's just there's a setting somewhere that you're unaware of or you've missed. And you know, like I said, do the uh, do the lifeline, phone a friend, look it up on the internet, ask an expert, um, and and then you can get past that. And it doesn't feel like it's ten dollars a print by the time you're done. Right. Yeah. And that's where people like you come to play, of course, too, is you know educating the public about it too. Absolutely. And people will write in and say, well, this is kind of a stupid question. It's not a stupid question. If you're, if you're stuck on it, if you're asking it, it's important to you. And uh, the, we'll call them quote, stupid questions are often ones that have simple answers and, and, you know, boom, you're right back on your way to, to realizing your creative dream. So no, ask mm-hmm. away. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, as we wrap up the show here, um, I'm just going to leave one question to sum this whole entire episode up. Um, if you do believe this, and I believe you do, but why should uh, every photographer print his or her work? Uh, because it is, it's the culmination of, of the vision, right? It, it is the final product. It's the tangible essence of what we do and why we do it. And it's that it's that final step. You know, you can look at a thousand images on your screen, but you're always going to have more of an attachment to the one that's in front of you, that's on paper. That's that's it. It's it's that fulfillment in so many ways. It's the it's the natural finish. It's it's why we do what we do. So that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This has been a great conversation, Evan. Um, where can people go to learn more about your work and about printing in, in general? Yeah, so um, I am a, a sometimes poster to Instagram. And uh, that for me is at uh, eparker.photo. Um, but the main reason why we're here is printing. And so that's moabpaper.com or cansoninfinity.com. 
uh, both Moab Paper and Canson Paper are the two brands that I work with for the profiling, the education, the training, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, and, and just get out there and, and keep going because, you know, it's a, whether you, whether you're a photographer for a living, whether you're a photographer for a hobby, you know, what a, what an incredible opportunity we have and, and so many doors it opens and, and places we get to go and, and things we capture. And, you know, I, I love it. I'm fired up. There's, there's nothing else I'd rather do. So it was a, awesome. it was a pleasure to join you too. And, and, and let's go forth and, and make some great images. Well, thank good. you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for coming on. I hope people mm -hmm. really learn a lot from this and I believe they will too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and before we go here, um, uh, Moab and Canson, they're both gracious enough to, uh, do a 10% discount, um, on all their papers, I believe. Um, so we're going to have the information for that down below. Uh, so make sure to check that out. We'll yeah, also be, be doing, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that'll be through hunts. And I think uh, we're working with them on actually getting that up to 15%. Oh, so nice. Ooh, we're blowing the better. doors off for this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Might as well, yeah. And um, speaking of hunts, we'll also be doing a hundred dollar gift card giveaway on our Instagram accounts, and that's all outdoors photography. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll be making a post, and basically anyone can comment, and we'll choose from that. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, and if you guys do any prints with those uh, Moab or Canson papers, be sure to send them in. We'd we'd love to see them. So. Yeah, and and uh, always post your prints to social media, and you can tag. You know, Moab paper, you can tag Canton Infinity and and we pick those up and, and we appreciate, you know, you showing off your work on our papers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so uh it's been a great episode. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys. Fifty fifty five is a home run. Thank you so much for watching the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.